So you're bringing in a guy that's turning 30 years old. Is he going to maintain a level that Manchester United need him to be at? Yes, people, and welcome back to Inside Scoop with myself, Culture Cams. And as you can see, my co-host is not here today. Listen, first and foremost, I need you guys to tell Harry Pinero to get to work. Turn up to work because, listen, he's not here. But we have to keep the channel going. You guys have been showing massive love this season. So it's all about the consistency. So first and foremost, please hit the likes, share and subscribe if you are not subscribed right now. And as I said last week, if you're looking for a gaming PC, make sure you hit up opsis.co.uk or hit me in the DMs and I'll give you guys a nice discount code. So listen, we're gonna talk about a few things anyway. It's gonna be kind of a culture cams news round. And the first thing we're gonna start with is, of course, the news that Raheem Sterling and Jaden Sancho are potentially in a swap deal situation, or maybe it's two separate deals, but realistically, one is going one way, the other is going the other. So it's a transfer which has the direct links to each other. Now, there's so much talk about it, right? Who's actually winning this transfer, first and foremost? Is it Chelsea taking Sancho? Of course, he's 24 years old. Good player, but it has not worked out at Manchester United at all. Is high wages, which is a lot of the talk about, are they winning the transfer that in that way? Or is it Manchester United taking Raheem Sterling, who probably people will say at this moment might be the better player and more useful, but he's approaching 30 in December. He's also, you know, not had the greatest time at Chelsea and he's an ex-Liverpool and City player. So it's kind of a crazy dilemma going on, but I want to break it down and kind of, get into it first and foremost i'm going to start from the chelsea perspective i kind of don't understand why chelsea are in for Jaden sancho and that's got nothing to do with the quality of the player but i look at chelsea's team at the moment and i see jao felix i see madueke who's on form you got mudrick still there you got jackson you have um Nkunku, you have cole palmer and you have pedro neto who just came in so seven attackers who I believe are seven good attackers. I mean, if you're looking at the depth of just pure quality in that Chelsea attack, you're talking about probably a top two attack potentially in the Premier League if it all clicks. So when they want to bring in Jadon Sancho, I'm kind of confused about that because I'm like, where is he going to play? Where Really, where is he going to play? And who does that mean the end of? Because when you look at the names that I've just mentioned, you're probably thinking it means the end of Mudrick. But Mudrik's another one who just came in for 80 million. And Maresca has spoken about certain things with him, but he also spoke that he wants to work with him and coach him to be better. So then you bring in Jaden Sancho. What does that mean for him? And does Jaden Sancho occupy the left or does he occupy the right? You've got Noni who's on hot form at the moment. You know, there was a situation I remember one time, Martial was on form and then Manchester United brought in Sancho, uh, Alexis Sanchez in January and that completely kind of killed it for Martial after that the form dropped and he just wasn't the same and you're looking at Noni at the moment fresh off a hat trick fresh off a goal against Servette he's on fire he's feeling himself you see it in his celebrations he's he means it at the moment so for him to now bring in a Jaden Sancho who, who's then gonna of course competition is is needed but he's going to want to start. He's going to be looking at it like, I've just come, I'm a new big signing. I'm not going from one bench to, up to the other. What does that mean for Noni? You know what I mean? Because it's kind of feeling like this could be his breakthrough season. We all know he's got quality and now it's time that he puts it down. So you kind of want him to have that freedom of thought that he knows he's going to play and he knows that Chelsea rely on him. So it's a little bit of a dilemma there. So I'm kind of looking at it like, where does he play? Does he potentially, Mareska potentially see him as a 10 option to be rotating with? Palmer, but then you have Felix there, then you have Nkunku. It's such a kind of strange dynamic for me, but if I'm Jaden Sancho and I'm looking and I'm seeing Juventus are after me, I'm be looking at that move. I mean, Chiesa is just going to Liverpool, which we'll get into. So I'm looking at it and I'm like, look, that's the place where I can start. 
I think that league will suit him. It's a bit slower. It's a bit more uh, poised, a bit more methodical. I think it will suit him. And you're playing under a manager in Thiago Mota, who is building a reputation as one of the best young managers in the world at the moment. You're looking at Alonso. You're looking at Arteta. And I think you'll be looking around uh, at Mota in, in and around that. So he's trying to build something at Juventus. Juventus right now have scored, I think, eight goals in their first two games. or might be six goals, zero conceded. They're on fire. And they're looking at they're playing that good football that he was playing at Bologna. So I'm, if I'm Sancho, I'll be looking to go out there. You know, England, it hasn't really worked out. He, do, he does his thing at Dortmund. And, you know, when you're away from the limelight, when you're away from the noise and everybody talking about you 24-7, I think that'll be a good place for him to go and play his football. So if I'm Sancho, if I'm his agent, I'll be recommending him to go to Juventus, man. I just think that's the move for him instead of Chelsea, where you're going to be in a club which at the moment is up and down. They're going through their their kind of, not turmoil, but they're going through their chaos. Do you want to be in and amongst that? I, I, I don't really know, you know, I don't really know. I wouldn't be suggesting that. And then Raheem Sterling, let's get into Raheem. This is another one where I'm like, I wanna be as respectful as possible, you know, towards Raheem because let's have it right. Like I'm gonna look through his numbers right now. I believe he is the second highest active goal scorer in the Premier League at the moment that's still playing in the Premier League behind um, Mohamed Salah, which, okay, people might say, oh, you're trying to gas it up and make it sound like really good or whatever. But he does, he has 173 goals in his career, but he has 123 goals in the Premier League. I mean, 123 goals in 379 games. It's a good record. You know, obviously we know about his seasons at, at Manchester City. There's a, it's a bit of a weird one. And I've seen the discussion. I've seen the debate around, around this with Manchester United fans. And basically what they're saying is there's two sides of things. There's, there's Sterling as a player right now. And there's Sterling about what he could be in, in the future, in the next couple of years. So some people see it as in the future side of things, you're bringing in a guy that's turning 30 years old. Is he, is he going to maintain a level that Manchester United need him to be at. Because you look at it at Chelsea, his last season at Man City, he scored 13 goals in the league. The next season, he scores six for Chelsea, then he scores eight. So his numbers have gone down. His performance level has probably gone down. Maybe his explosiveness has reduced a little bit. And what he is as a player that we saw at Man City, maybe is not the player that we see at Chelsea as much. So there's that kind of question mark. Man United have been in situations where, you know, you had a player who's come in, look at Casemiro, for example. He come in, yeah, he's got the reputation, but then within a season, you're like, mm, maybe we need him gone. Varane, you know, as much as I loved Varane, but, you know, he had the injury issues. It, within a season, you're like, mm, Zlatan, same thing. Like, okay, Zlatan was 35, 36, but he, he played like a 30-year-old at the time. But you kind of get what I mean in terms of these type of signings. And this is what we as fans, when Ineos came in, we thought, there's no way this is going to be the type of signings we make. You know, everyone's been 26 and under, uphill signings. You know, when you look at them, you're thinking, okay, they've got a, another level to go to. Delit, Xerxes, um, who else have we signed? Yoro. You know, you're looking at those type of signings. You're thinking, okay, you know, Ugarte, who should be coming in. You're looking at, you're like, all right, 23, 24, 18. Maybe something can, can cook up there. But with Raheem Sterling, it's clearly a player that's in decline, so that's a worry, you know, and that decline doesn't mean he's washed or he's finished, but he's a player that's not at the level that he used to be. And then you're bringing him to Man United, ex-Liverpool, ex-City. How's that going to go down with the fans in the stadium? It's a bit crazy. I mean, I know there's there's been like Robbie Fowler. There's been like, um, was it Robbie Fowler and James Milner? I know they played for for Leeds. They played for City. They played for Liverpool as well. So... Raheem Sterling's a little bit in that boat where he's played for two of the biggest rivals. So I don't know how that's going to go down with the match going fans. But let's talk about Raheem Sterling in the present. Uncomfortable conversation right now is Raheem Sterling outscored all of Manchester United's attackers in the league last season. Well, other than Rasmus Hoyland, who's a striker. He scored more goals than Ganacho, He scored more goals than Ahmed. Of course, he didn't really play too much. More goals than Marcus Rashford. More goals than Anthony. 
So at this present moment, when you're looking at it in terms of comparison to the player, Raheem Sterling to Rashford, Anthony, Garnacho, are they better than Raheem Sterling right now in 2024? In a way, they might not be. So in terms of actual player quality and what he could add to the team this season, he might be more useful than the guys that Manchester United currently have. And that's such a scary thing to say because you're looking at what Manchester United, the age of Manchester United's attackers. Of course, some of them are young, like Garnacho, so I'm not going to be too crazy, but looking like a Marcus Rashford, who's 26, turning 27, should be in the prime of his career. When Raheem Sterling was 26, 25, 26, 27, he was scoring 20 league goals. You know what I mean? He was winning Premier League titles. And you're looking at Marcus Rashford on the other hand, and the fact that some people are even considering, like, yo, we might have to bring in Raheem because Rashford's not playing to the level and it's a scary prospect. It's, it's actually crazy to think about. So in this current moment, I saw Troy Deeney say, he's better than anything Manchester United had. He was a little bit too dismissive the way he was saying it. And one thing I would say to this argument is, okay, he may be better currently than what Manchester United have, but you only ever use that term, what we have or what they have when it's a bad situation on top of a bad situation. And we've been there before. Oh, let's bring in Anthony. He's he, he's better than what we have in a, in a langer. You know, let's bring in this player. Let's bring in Amrabat. Oh, he's better than what we have. Oh, bring in Amrabat. He's better than what we have in Scott McTominay. Oh, bring in this player. He's better than what we have. That better than what we have mentality can cripple you. It can hold you back. You know what I mean? So you don't want to just get players because they're better than maybe the bad players that you have. You want to get players because they're generally quality. They generally serve value. They generally have an upside and can potentially go on to be legends of the football club. So is Raheem Sterling that? I have my doubts, but it's, it's, it's one of the most interesting swap deals I've seen since Mkhitaryan and and um, Alexis Sanchez when they went the other way or Pjanic and Artar when they went the other way. Just very weird kind of transfers, but let's see how it goes. Now, I'm going to move on from Jaden Sancho and uh, Raheem Stern. Let's see how that one goes. Liverpool have just announced, well, not Liverpool, well, Fabrizio has just announced that here we go, or should we say there we land these days, with um, Chiesa going to Liverpool at the moment for £10 million. Guys, if I told you after the Euro 2021, which is Euro 2020, but obviously it was paid in 21, if I told you after Euros that Chiesa will be a £10 million signing three years later, you guys would probably be like, yeah, add another zero onto that. Because he looked like a superstar at that tournament. And we've seen him in moments at Juventus just tear people to shreds. But of course, injuries have happened. Since then, he's been very injury prone. He's still only 26 years old. And yes, last season wasn't the greatest year, which is why Juventus kind of look like they're happy to let the guy go. But I'm like, this is such a low risk, cheap gamble for Liverpool. And when you look at it, right, how often do Liverpool get these wrong? Not too much. Maybe you could say Gakpo hasn't worked out or Darwin Nunes. That's a big money signing. But I'm looking at these kind of shrewd deals that Liverpool like to do. Just the shrewd ones. The Mane's, the the uh, Andrew Robertson's. Like those type of deal. Why now them? Liverpool tend to get these ones right. So when I'm looking at that, I'm like, hold on a second. Can this be one of those quiet masterstrokes? Because one thing we have seen as well is that yes, um, Onslaught plays this passing and good football as well. But one thing that Onslaught does do is he still relies on that transition, which they're so familiar with under Jurgen Klopp. So in transition, Kesar in his when he was fit, was one of the best transition players in the world. So you're thinking about it, you know, Luis Diaz, Darwin Nunes, Kesa. Salah, Jota, them type of players in transition are are deadly. I'm looking forward to seeing how this signing goes. I mean, is it going to be 
a superstar signing? Maybe not, but is it going to be a healthy addition to the squad for a team that are in the Champions League as well? They're going to have a lot of games. I think so. So I'm looking forward to seeing it. And I mentioned the name just now. And that name was Darwin Nunes. Now, there's been some links to Darwin Nunes to Arsenal. Now, the source, it doesn't seem like the most credible source in the world, but it's starting to circulate. Darwin Nunes to Arsenal. I think Arteta has a saviour fetish, you know. I think he has a saviour fetish. He wanted to save Jesus. He wanted to save Zinni. He wanted to save Kai Havertz. And fair enough to him, they've actually kind of worked out, to be fair. You know what I mean? Okay, Jesus had injuries. Zinni had a bad season. But that first season when them two came in, they turned it up for Arsenal. You know what I mean? They made up, they, they, they contributed to what Arsenal are today. And Kai Havertz last season, I mean, from January onwards, I think he had 16 goals and assists. He just turned up. So Arteta's faith in him showed. Him. I remember when he scored that charity penalty, I think it was. And Arteta was pointing to him like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was a little bit cringe, but he could show that's, listen, he's going to arrive. Like, support him, get behind him. And maybe that's what he's going to try and do with Darwin Nunes, a player that can play on the left wing, a player that can play up front, deadly in transition. But of course, we know his finishing issues are unbelievable. But, you know, sometimes it just takes a change of environment, people, for someone to just spark. That's what Chelsea will be hoping on the Jaden Sancho. That's what I remember. There was a player that played for Man United. You all know, of course, Diego Forlan. I mean, he came, he was at Man United. He couldn't hit a barn door. He scored two goals against Liverpool, but really he struggled. Then all of a sudden, he goes off to Villarreal. And he just turns into literally Europe's, arguably Europe's biggest gunman. I mean, he was banging. He won the, the Pachichi. He went to Atletico. He was killing it. The guy was Uruguay. He was banging it. Everyone remembers the 2010 World Cup. He just exploded in a different environment. So you never really know what can happen with these type of things. So I'll keep an eye out on that one. Definitely keep an eye out. That was, that's an interesting one, but I don't think it's going to happen. But hey, anything can happen these last couple of days. It's a wild card moment. I think we've got, we've got three days left of the transfer window. Three days. Hey, stay tuned for that. But listen, lastly, let's get into what the big game is this weekend. And of course, the big game this weekend is Manchester United versus Liverpool at Old Trafford. And this is one of them games where, okay, you're looking at, I'm looking at the probability right now as I speak to you guys. And Liverpool are 52% chance of winning. Manchester United, 25%, draw 23%. So they're basically giving Liverpool, uh, Liverpool are the favourites for this game, even though it's at Old Trafford. But you see, last season, something similar like this happened where Liverpool were the better team. Liverpool going into this on form. Liverpool have been the better team for a while. But Manchester United did not lose a game to Liverpool last year. Now, OK, it's a different manager. It's a different situation. But Man United didn't lose a game to Liverpool last year and it included knocking them out at the FA Cup, which Man United, of course, went on to win. So what I'm trying to say here is that form goes out the way in these type of games. I remember when Man United were the better team, you know, under the Fergie days. And Liverpool will still get results. Going to Anfield was hell. You know what I mean? So I see this, this one and I see it as a... I still see it as a bit of a 50-50 game. I, I, I really do. I still see it as a bit of a 50-50 game. As bad as Manchester United, I wouldn't say as bad as they are, but of course the disappointing result against Brighton, not the greatest performance yet in the first two games. But these are just type of games that Man United fans, we get up for. Old Trafford will be rocking. And of course it depends on how you start. In the first 20 minutes, you kind of set the tone. So that's the most important thing. And I'm looking at who's going to where the danger is, who's the worries. Now, I'm looking at Liverpool's right-hand side at the moment. Salah's looking sharp. He's looking much sharper than last season. It looks like he had a good rest. Trent is looking up for it. He, Of course, he came off the other day and was sulking, which I actually don't know what that was all about. I felt like he was extending that for a little bit too long, but whatever. Arn Slot had to come and speak to him on the bench. I was like, I mean... Calm down, fella. Do you know what I mean? Calm down is just a substitution. You're going to win the game. I don't know what that was all about. And after the game, people were talking to him. I'm like, I mean, did this guy have like money on on scoring or something? I'm I'm, I'm totally confused what that was all about. But um, he's on form. That right-hand side is the best right-hand side in the Premier League. 
that right hand side you can arguably say is the best right hand side in the history of the Premier League I mean in terms of what the output be combined between those two are Mo Salah and Trent so Dallow has a tough job because he's going to start at left back Lissandro Martinez his first two games have not been good enough I don't know if it's because he's unfit or what's going on played in the Copa final but he hasn't come back up to scratch so that's a big that is that right hand side section and our left hand side section is where the danger is going to be in my opinion but then you can't see from people like Jota but that's a question now does Delit come into the team or does Maguire still start so there's so many questions that need to be answered Liverpool are still going to probably play Gravenberg in the six can Man United overrun him can Man United in the transition because that's how United play, transition football. So it's going to be an open game. Can Man United exploit that? Is he going to have the defensive discipline just to kind of anchor and look after that situation? These are things that I think we're going to, we need to find out. But these are the moments where I'm looking at like, how can each other, how can each team hurt each other? But one thing that needs to be, definitely needs to happen is Manchester United players need to be clinical. Most big chances missed in the Premier League, Manchester United with six. You look at the Garnacho moment the other day. Yes, Xerxes, I don't know why he was there. And I know Garnacho shot was going on target, but it kind of makes you think the goal was right there. How come it even hit Xerxes? Do you know what I mean? You're looking at the open goal, of course, against Fulham from Garnacho. You're looking at the chances that was missed. Mount, Bruno, two sitters. So it's like Man United need to be quality because one thing about United is defensively, they don't hold teams out enough. Don't They don't hold teams out enough. So if you don't score, you're leaving yourself too open to go and concede. Liverpool, they put the ball in the back of the net. That transition goal from Luis Diaz, boom, no hesitation, couple passes, goal. Man United need to be clinical against a team like Liverpool. So that's on Ahmad. That's on Marcus Rashford, especially. These are the games he gets up for. These are the games that no matter his form has been down, you always fancy him in a big six game. So is he going to start? People don't want him starting at the moment. Ahmad's playing well. Ganacho's looking hungry off the bench. So a lot of people don't even want Marcus Rashford starting. But these are the games that he comes alive for. And he may not go and score for the next six weeks, but these are the ones. So it's a big decision from Ten Hag. And of course, Xerxes, if he starts, needs to score goals. Mason Mount, the pressing and stuff is great. He, we need some more on-ball quality. He needs to score goals. He needs to get some assists. Bruno as well. So if United are not clinical in this game, they have not got a chance. But I'm going to actually go for... I was actually saying 2-1 to Liverpool um, the other day. I think it might be a draw, but because I've said 2-1 already, I'm actually going to go 2-1 Liverpool, unfortunately. But... A performance matters now when you start thinking that Man United could potentially lose their two of the first three yo it might start getting toxic and I hope it doesn't but it might start getting toxic it starts getting worrying it starts getting worried that you're going to have a repeat of last season because you're looking at other teams Arsenal Brighton have started well Spurs Newcastle you know Aston Villa they're going to be in and around so eighth place doesn't mean it can't happen again doesn't mean it can't happen again guys but listen, guys, that was another episode of the Inside Scoop. Of course, it was myself hold down the fort today. You know what I mean? Just holding it down for you guys. HP should be back next week. And we'll talk about, of course, the Liverpool game. We'll talk about everything else. By the way, guys, you lot turned up when with that question. I asked a question um, and I put a question out there for everybody in a question time, which we're going to do more of. And it was the, who are the top five finishers when it comes to variety? Listen, I, the numbers that that has done, that has done a million, that has done a million on YouTube, um, on Instagram. I'm just looking at it now. A million on Instagram. It's got 5,000 comments. On Twitter, it did 3,000. It did, um, on TikTok, it's going off. Honestly, that was unreal. So you guys look out for the next question time, which will probably be probably be next week. Make sure you hit the likes. Make sure you share. Make sure you subscribe. If you are not, we want to get to 20K as soon as possible. I think we're on 19.1K. Let's get ourselves to 20K. 
of course it's myself culture cams make sure you guys follow my twitch as well i'm gonna be twitch streaming make sure you follow all my socials of course and that's another episode i'm out